Hi everyone, let's have a look at another Lagrange multipliers problem. We want to find the maximum and minimum values of this function p subject to this constraint that x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 3. So in our constraint we'll call this our function g of xy. By the method of Lagrange multipliers we need to solve the corresponding equations. The gradient of p has to be some multiple of the gradient of g and we need the constraint equation to hold. So we're trying to find x and y that satisfy these three equations. So there's two equations hidden in the gradient equation because these functions are of two variables so the gradients are two-dimensional vectors. So what are our gradient equations? They unpack to px p sub x is equal to lambda g sub x. Then we also get p sub y is equal to lambda g sub y. And we get that g of x y is equal to 3, so we get our constraint equation, which we'll rewrite again as x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 3. So those are our three equations. In this case, when we take the derivative p sub x, we get 2x plus y is equal to lambda times g sub x. g sub x is 2x. So that would be 2 lambda x. P sub y, that's x plus 4y minus 1. And that's equal to lambda times g sub y. g sub y is 4y, so this would be 4 lambda y. Now we've got our three equations, three unknowns, x, y, and lambda. We need to solve these. Again, there's no, uh, there's no method, there's no technique to do this for nonlinear equations. So we can just do whatever we can, do the best we can in this case, try to exploit some patterns if you can. And so here I'm going to notice that I've got a lambda x in this one and I've got a lambda y in this one. So if I took my first equation and multiplied it by uh, y, then I would have a lambda x y on that side. So I'll do that. And I'll make my first equation the equation above multiplied by y. So that's 2xy plus y squared is equal to 2 lambda xy. My second equation that I'm going to construct is going to be the one above this multiplied by x. So that's x squared plus 4xy minus x is equal to 4 lambda xy. And the nice thing here is that now this is 2 lambda xy whereas this one is 4 lambda xy. So that means if I multiplied equation 1 by 2, then the left-hand side of that would be equal to the left-hand side of equation 2. So multiply by 2, so I take 2 times equation 1, and I'm going to set the left-hand side of that equal to equation 2, because both of those are going to be equal to 4 lambda xy. So I get 4 xy, plus 2y squared. That's the left-hand side of equation 1 multiplied by 2. That's equal to 4 lambda xy, but 4 lambda xy is equal to x squared plus 4xy minus x by equation 2. I get a 4xy that's in common with both of these, and so I get that 2y squared is equal to x squared minus x. So there's a nice equation relating x's and y's that allows me to replace anywhere I see a y squared, I can replace it with an expression involving x's. And in fact, this is perfect because I see a 2y squared right there in our constraint equation. So what we'll do is we'll substitute, I'll call this equation star, substitute star into constraint. And when we do that, we get x squared plus 2y squared, which is x squared minus x, is equal to 3. Or in other words, 2x squared minus x minus 3 is equal to 0. But this factors nicely. This factors as an x plus 1 and a 2x minus 3. So that tells us that x is equal to negative 1 or 3 halves. And that's excellent because that tells us 
that we're trying to solve these three equations for x and y and lambda, and we've just found that there are only two possible choices for the x value. It's either negative one or three halves. So we can use those to find the y values. So if x is negative one, what am I gonna do? Well, I'm going to plug it into star because that's the relationship between x and y. By star, we get that two y squared is equal to negative one squared, which is one, minus minus one, which is one. So we get that that's equal to two, or y squared is equal to one, or y is equal to plus or minus one. So therefore, x, y is equal to negative one plus or minus one. So we've got two points, two possible solutions. Are there more? Well, we still need to check the other case of x. x is equal to three halves. We can plug that into star. So we get two y squared is equal to three halves squared, so that's nine quarters, minus three halves. So I'll write that as six quarters, because then that becomes a three quarters. Or in other words, y is equal to the square root of three eighths. And it's a plus or a minus. So therefore, we get xy is equal to three halves plus or minus the square root of three eighths. So there's our other two solutions. And therefore, that original set of three equations in three unknowns, which we've got here, constraint and our two equations coming from the gradients being parallel, those equations have solution x and y equal to any of the re these four points. I haven't bothered solving for the lambda value, the Lagrange multiplier value, uh, because I don't actually need that. Once I found the x's and y's, those are what I'm interested in. I'm interested in those points where the maximum and minimum values can occur. And so what do I do with these? Well, these are all now my candidates for absolute extrema, absolute max and absolute mins. So I can just compute the function value at these points and see what we get. So we're going to take our points, plug them into our function, pxy, and see what we get. So negative one, negative one, negative one, one, three halves, plus, or maybe we'll do minus first, minus root three eighths, and three halves plus root three eighths. So those are the four points we have for where our extrema can occur. We can work out our function value at each of these points. We'll get a five for the first one, a one for the second one, a three plus one half root three eighths and a three minus one half root three eighths. And then we can compare all these values. Which one's biggest? This one's our absolute max. Five is the biggest out of all those numbers. So this is our maximum. And one is the smallest out of those numbers. So this is our minimum. So we found our maximum value and where it occurs and we found our minimum value and where it occurs. Now it does help to look at the visual. Um, here what I've done is I've plotted the constraint curve. I'll highlight that one. It's The constraint curve is this one here, the one I indicated in gray, but I'll just change its color to make it more easily seen. So there's our constraint curve. And what we did was we constructed all the points for which the level curve at that point is tangent to the constraint curve. The points we found were those four points and they are these ones. Negative one, uh, one. This is our point negative one, negative one down here. We also had the point three halves and plus root three over eight and three halves and minus root three over eight somewhere around there. One other thing to note is that as we move outwards, P is increasing. 
the function p is increasing. And we can see these from these level curves, that as I move outwards, I'm first, the, the first level curve k equals 1 is shown there, then I go out to the yellow level curve, which is a little bit bigger, then I go out to the blue level curve, which is a little bit bigger, and then I go out to the last level curve that I've drawn, which is the k equals 5 level curve. So p is increasing. And so now we can see exactly why each point is a max or a min or even local extrema as well. So as I scream along the red curve, let's say we're going to this point in the upper left, so maybe I'll, I'll do it here. As I move along this constraint curve, since I'm getting closer and closer to the green level curve, I've, I refer to my direction here that as I move away, in some sense as I move away or outwards, I'm my p-value is increasing, so as I move inwards, my p-value is decreasing. So my p-value is decreasing here. And then my p-value is increasing on this side. So I know that this point right here has to be a minimum, or a local minimum. Because I'm coming down to it, and then I'm going up away from it. And what about another point? this yellow point down here. Well, I'm coming to it from the inside of the level curve. So I'm going up, 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 up. I hit the yellow point and then I go down, down, down. So in other words, P is increasing as I move along this and now P is decreasing as I move away from it. So that point there, this is going to be a local max. And similarly for these other ones. So this one, I'm coming at it from outside of it. Coming outside, touching the curve, and then uh, moving away again. So I'm dropping in value, P is decreasing, hit the point, and then P is increasing away from it. So this is a local min. And then this one over here is a local max. So I've got my local extrema. And in fact, I look at the level curves that I'm at for all four of these points and I see that the smallest level curve I'm at is the k equals 1 level curve. So not only is this a local one up here, but it is also an absolute minimum. And not only is the one far away here, the one that is on the k equals 5 level curve, a local one, it is also an absolute max. And so we can see this information as well from our level curve diagrams. All right, so that's it for this example. If you want to see some more examples involving Lagrange multipliers, then you can check out the next videos. Thanks for watching.